Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, your mindfulness and meditation coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ron Johnson, your life coach, mindfulness coach, and now NLP practitioner. And welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And today is a special guest. He's a CEO of a company, and he helps those coaches out there looking to elevate their business to the next level. And before we hop into actually what he does, we always want to get the backstory of our guest. So Maxwell Lee Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Thank you for taking this time out of your day to talk with Gloria and I and to the rest of the world who's so going to be listening to our podcast. Awesome. Thank you, Ronald and Gloria. Thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. Not a problem, man. So before we ever go into discussing uh, about your business, what you do now, it would be nice to kind of get a backstory of I, obviously where you are today is a based upon where you are today is a reflection of what decisions you made in your past. So kind of tell us um, where where are you, where are you, where do you come from? How did you get where you are today? Yeah. Yeah. So I um, was actually born in Australia and uh, I'd spent my whole life there. And, um, you know, one day um, I'd worked in corporate banking in Australia for like Australia's biggest bank for about five years. I walked in there one day and looked at my boss and his boss and his boss and his boss. And, you know, within about three seconds, I realized that I did not want any of their jobs. So then I really sort of checked in and looked at myself and thought um, to myself, you know, what, what am I doing here? And um, it hit me, you know, it really, really hit me that, um, you know, this whole corporate job thing, it was always plan B, you know, plan A was to be an entrepreneur, go out there and make a difference, have you know, unlimited impacts, um, you know, take the risk and all that sort of thing. And, um, and then what it, what really hit me was that, you know, I had been almost like lying to myself for about five years, building this, you know, um, this Sistine Chapel of a plan B when I was really just afraid to go for plan A, which is to go out there and, and, and build my own business. So, you know, whatever that may be. Um, so that really hit me. And then I went out my journey to um, just sort of find what sort of business and what kind of business I wanted to build from then on. And, uh, you know, three and a bit years later, I've landed here. Awesome, dude. Wow. So, so, you know, what was that? Like, what, what feelings and thoughts went through your mind when you walked in that office? Like, you know what? I do not belong here. Like, what was it? What did it feel like? Kind of give us a description of people don't mind. Yeah, so it was, you know, the whole experience was was a bit of like a perfect storm because, you know, I, I had gone into the um, the banking career and like my first job, I received like, you know, I worked really hard and received like three promotions within five years. I was like the youngest corporate analyst in the state and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I went in there really, really hot and heavy with with the intention to stay, right, and the intention to to go for a CEO and, and you know, all that sort of stuff. And then... Um, it, 
you know, the weights, what was the turning point for me was that um, in my role at that point in time, it's, there was limitations on how much I could succeed. So there was like restrictions and there were things completely outside of my control. So like regulatory restrictions or, um, you know, we were going through like the, 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 the impact and the, and the sort of the aftermath of the global financial crisis at that point in Australia. And, um, you know, so banking had become really, really tight. So what, what, what the, what my employer would do is that they would set targets of, you know, if you hit a hundred out of a hundred, you get this and you're a rock star, but due to banking regulations and all this sort of stuff, you can realistically only hit 40 out of a hundred. And, you know, there's no, there's no deeper way to demotivate me <laughs> than basically, <laughs> than basically putting a lid on what I can achieve. So, um, so there was that plus like a regulatory sweep as a result of the global financial crisis in a, as like an aftermath of it. And it was just like this perfect storm of things that just I, um, I had tolerated for probably about a year and then I just couldn't tolerate anymore. So, you know, for me, it was a bit like jumping from like one burning ship to another um, because the other burning ship was, you know, it, it was something I really wanted, which is to build my own business, but it was as scary as anything. You know, because I, I I had never, um, you know, not had stable income before. And that was, I was jumping onto that sort of burning ship. So it really felt like jumping from one burning ship to another. There's always that fear of, um, of starting, starting your own business. It's kind of like gambling, right? You don't know if you'll make it or not. And that was, I think, that's one thing that holds back a lot of people when you always want to start your own business is um just uh, just taking a chance and so what i i just wanted to um ask um that um, company where you were in the banking um so there wasn't a lot of room for growth is that what it was too yeah so the only room for growth would be for me to hang around for um another 10 15 years to um, to maybe get my boss's job or his job or his boss's job. And I looked at their job and just looked at the look, <laughs> looked at their faces and thought to myself, man, <laughs> they, they did not look happy and they did not look like, like <laughs> the expression on their faces does not look like it's worth hanging around for 10 to 15 years to maybe get there. Like it just, it just didn't look worth it. So then, and that, yeah. yeah. And that's a maybe too. So it wasn't, it wasn't guaranteed. Yeah, it's just like a massive maybe. And, you know, I, I have no problem trusting and, and you know, I, I have no problem sort of um, like I'm not like a, I'm not someone that needs to have control over, over certain outcomes, but it was just, it was uninspiring. You know, it was uninspiring top to bottom, just uh, being there and uh, that was massively demotivating. And then, and that just started to just eat away at me, you know, from the inside out. You know, let me ask this question. <clears throat> when it came to, to money, it's a, in, the, in this case for you, and you said something that kind of I, I heard was like, well, you, you want me to earn X amount of money and you are taking away my earning potential, then I, I'm out of here. You know, this doesn't really work. I want to earn as much as I can, right? Especially if it's commission based. What, what is your idea? Um, what does money mean to you in, in that sense? Yeah, so money, you know, doesn't really mean a lot to me, to be honest. You know, it wasn't. It's not so much about the money, like the the money in 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 work and in whatever. It's almost like a um, well, the money in business. The way I look at it is that money is like petrol. You know, it's like fuel. So it, it's it's petrol in the tank that allows you to go further. So you need you need enough petrol, otherwise your car is going to stop and stall. You know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months from now. And then um, the whole reason why you started the business, which is whatever freedom or impact or the people you want to help, you know, they one year from now, then they're not going to know who you are. So, so right now, to me, money is petrol in the tank. Uh, back then, money to me was a um, uh, it was recognition as a as like a measuring stick for um, how much work I'd put in. So. 
you know, what really did motivate me was that I could put in, I could have put in, you know, 400% work and, and still had like a limit, uh, like a lid on top of me based on just, you know, the way stuff is. And, um, I just wasn't willing or, um, probably will just willing. I just wasn't willing to accept that. So what finally got you to just get up and leave, get up and go and start this? Yeah, it was, it was, it was really like a perfect storm. So there was like the regulatory sweep that was making work really, really hard because there was all these like extra things we had to do that we didn't have to do before. There was the, the earning sort of, um, like the success limit, success lid that was on top of me, that just like bottling me in. Um, and also I I just came out of a relationship as well at that point in time. So then it was like, you know, all of a sudden I had given myself permission to have wings to, to go and do and, and be uh, wherever I wanted to be um, without having to, um, you know, consider anyone else besides myself. Um, so they're like those three things just created like this, um, almost like this bullseye, uh, that I, that I imagine in my mind of, um, okay. So it's almost like I've got a blank slate now because I'm not attached to this career I've been building for five years. Uh, where do I go from here? That's very interesting. So did you always want to be in the banking industry or did it, it kind of evolve into the fact that that's kind of where you landed because you went to school? How did that you come in, into the equation? Yeah, so I, I um, you know, I, I didn't always know I wanted to be in banking. There was a few things that happened that sort of led me towards that. Like I, you know, I was in university trying to figure myself out like everyone there. And, um, you know, I had... I'd been to a few university social events and I had sort of rubbed shoulders with a few um, guys in um, in the finance world or that was going for, you know, really high-end finance jobs, like investment banking jobs. I thought, okay, you know, this is pretty cool and these guys are pretty cool and and um, I get along with these guys and, you know, there's there seems to be enough, like, um, uh, enough of a, like a, a high target to, to go for this, you know, high-end banking thing. So why not uh, Why not go for it? And then I sort of romanticize about, you know, living and working in New York City, um, being a banker there and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And it sort of evolved not necessarily out of something I had always wanted, but it evolved out of um, me wanting to find a – a goal to put on my radar. Interesting. And what was that goal in your radar? Yeah. So the ultimate goal on my radar was to be a, a um, an investment banker in New York City. Big glamorous New York. That's so what about New York one. was so attractive? I I never been there, but people that have been there said it's a lot of people. It's open twenty four hours a day. You can get anything you want. What was the lore about New York? Yeah, it's just you know what you know, it, it, it's pretty. Uh, I don't know. You could say it's pretty shallow, but it's just just what you see on TV. You know, like when you when you live in Australia and um, you know, and you watch movies and you watch shows, and you watch stuff, and you know, almost everything's based in New York City, and you just you imagine it being like this magical place, like that can almost like do no wrong. Um, so it's just you know, like Hollywood brainwashing, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad you're honest about that. It is. It's pretty nice up there. Um, and it, what should I say? So I, I like how you said it's exactly like what you see on TV because it kind of is. That's if you go to Times Square, but anywhere else around it is a little different. So were you able to accomplish that goal? Um, no. So, so when I left the bank, um, the first place I moved, so I picked. So when I left, when I re I decided to leave the bank, I realized that um, you know what I haven't been growing. You know I hadn't been growing at the pace that I really wanted. I was hungry to um, for like the last five years that I was banking because I realized I'd been you know sort of afraid and avoiding going for what I really wanted was to which was to have my own business. And what 
Um, so what I chose to do was I chose to move to a place I'd never been before, had no friends, had no job, no place to stay, and um, like no connections. So um, New York City, like moving as an Australian to America, isn't as simple as just I want to move there and let's make it happen. So there is actually a, a really accessible visa for Australians to move to Canada. So I moved to as close as I could to New York, um, which people describe as like the baby New York, uh, which is Toronto. So I moved to Toronto, Canada. So that's why I moved there. And uh, my my initial idea at the time was, okay, you know, I'll be close enough to New York to sort of be back and forth and, and, and you know, make something happen. And I'm in the same time zone compared to not being in the same time zone. And at least I'm in North America. So uh, I went from Australia to New York and that was the rationale um, <laughs> at that point in time. I, I hear something. What, 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 so being from Australia, so when I see Australia, uh, you're born and raised there, correct? I just want to confirm that. Yeah, that's right. I see what I see Australia is that I watched a lot of National Geographic growing up. So I see um, Aboriginals that I guess were native there. I see the pristine waters. I see the outback, they call it. I see, obviously, everything in Australia, they tell you it's, it's going to kill you. It's going to be a small spider the size of a, of a nickel that can kill you, right? Or a small little snake. And I see how beautiful it is. So why would you want to live from, go from Australia to America? What was the lower there? Yeah, so it's probably not, um, it's probably not, I, I, you know, I definitely probably don't represent the majority. Um, I am a extrovert. So I love people. I love energy. You know, I love people so much to the point where, you know, during like Christmas or like Thanksgiving, like Friday, Cyber Monday, I actually love walking out and going to shopping malls, shopping centers, and just being there, not even buying anything. Like I love being around people so much. I love just being around busy crowds because I love energy. And um, New York has that energy. You know, New York's like the the epicenter of the world for that sort of busy energy, um, which I really sort of feed off. So that's one element. Another element is that, um, you know, in Australia, it, it, Australia's always seen as like, yeah, Australia. And the bigger game is either London or New York. Um, no matter which way you slice the pie, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're in banking or you're in, I don't know, um, insurance or like, HR or um, events or whatever, like, you know, Australia is a bit like the, um, you know, the the minor leagues and then like even Sydney is like a minor league compared to New York or London in the UK, which is like the major leagues. Yeah, so that's, Interesting metaphor that, there. Yeah, that makes sense why New York and it's it actually, you, you love that. You love to have that type of human connection that even if, like what you said, you're not shopping, you're shopping, but even if you're not buying, you're just out there. You just love to have it. So that's how you get your energy. Yeah. Off of the people around you and the crowd in New York is a perfect, um, perfect space. Actually, I like the way you said that, New York. I was trying to say that in my head, but. <laughs> and um, yeah, so now um, with that, and then you said you were in Canada and you lived in Canada for a year. So from Canada, what was life, what was life like for you? Yeah. So Canada was really cool. You know, Canada was really cool because, um, I, I had gone for like two more jobs just to, just to double, double check that, you know, what I was missing or what, what made me unhappy wasn't just the workplace, but it was the idea of having a job. So I'd, I I actually had like a part-time job at Lululemon, which is super, super chill and relaxed and cool. And, you know, you get to wear Lululemon to work compared to like a suit and tie. And then um, another job at a, as like a, um, you know, head of, head of sales for a, um, head of sales for like a, a startup where we worked in like this startup hub where, you know, we, it was like free food, tea and coffee, bean bags, walking around barefoot, fake grass, like all that sort of stuff that you see on TV that, that makes, you know, working in the corporate world look really, really boring. And I did both of those and I realized, whoa, 
you know, I, I've got the same feeling. I've got the same sort of feeling of unhappiness and and lack of satisfaction and, and lack of fulfillment uh, that I felt working for the bank. So I said, okay, so the problem, um, you know, by process of elimination, the problem must be in, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not ready to surrender uh, my, my life and my, my work and my work ethic and my energy towards someone else's goal. So um, what it, what it came down to was, okay, so I've got to, I've got to actually give this, you know, scary, threatening, um, you know, high risk thing of starting your own business from zero, uh, a real shot now. That's awesome, man. You know, your story is very, very fundamental because you know, you've done a lot of different things. And then at some point you found your passion, right? Or your purpose and kind of, so now you, you, would you say that you found your passion or your purpose to life? Yeah. So, you know, I think, let me think. I, I don't know if it exists. So maybe I'm just saying this because I, I haven't had that sensation, but I, I, yeah. So what, I guess what I'm saying is I've never actually had the sensation that I've, I've reached like this, you know, holy hallelujah moment in my life where I'm like, this is what I should be doing or this is what I can be doing. Um, you know, I've, I, I live my life a little bit differently. I live my life not really looking for anything. Um, I live my life, um, just working on, you know, what makes me feel alive and, um, maybe you could call, you know, my work right now, which is what makes me feel most alive, um, as like my hallelujah, um, like thing, but I wouldn't relate to it as that. I would re just relate to it as, um, you know what I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm having fun. Um, I'm helping people. I'm making a difference in their lives, uh, making a difference in my life by helping them and everything I get out of helping them. And, um, you know, I get to, as a, as a bonus and like a, a side effect of that is I, I get, if I, if I commit at being really, really good at what I'm doing, then I also get to have like a, an ideal lifestyle or, um, a lifestyle that I am really, really happy with. So there is some benefit to, to doing what you're doing now, right? So you have, let's say, a vision of a lifestyle and you want to tame that lifestyle, right? And, you know, what if you had, like, close your eyes right now and you had the vision of lifestyle and, you know, let, let's say disregard your passion, your purpose, what would that lifestyle look like for you? Yeah, it would be exactly what I'm doing now. You know, I... um like the first probably year and 18 months of being an entrepreneur was hard. Um, you know, you're figuring a lot of stuff out. You're constantly overcoming fears and, and, and it's either all or nothing. And, um, you know, I was like sleeping on couches. I was like selling like belts and speakers and, and, and things like that just to pay for rent. Right. And then I was like eating food from um, like I was, I would go to the supermarket, the cheapest supermarket in Toronto that was around the corner from my house and go and buy like minced beef. And then what, and you know, I'd just go through and look at what was the cheapest minced beef per kilo, per kilogram or per pound actually. And, um, and, and just keep doing that and keep scrooging and, and buying like, like there was like three different types of eggs and I picked the cheapest one, whatever the cheapest one was. And, um, so, you know, I did that for like a year, you know, a, a year and a half and, uh, and, but, you know, I, I'm really grateful for that because it's, you know, that's when you sort of really, really dig deep down to like the bones of, uh, what you get to rebuild, um, as like a, a badass, you know, powerful entrepreneur that that's, that's unstoppable, just moving towards what they want. And, um, you know, like it never ends. Like there's always more rebuilding and more fears, fears to face and everything. But, you know, there is a, like a level of comfortability in my life right now that I can uh, fortunately, uh, you know, work online and and have the time to work 
and have great podcast conversations with yourself, Ronald and yourself, Gloria, and not feel guilty that I, you know, um, that I haven't, you know, spent 10 hours today trying to find uh, the next client and, and all that sort of stuff. So there is, um, there is an element of, of, yeah, like I, I, I really love where I'm at right now. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> it definitely wasn't easy and, and, and I didn't fall in, I didn't fall here. Um, it was as a result of, of all of that scrooging and tightening the belts and, and, um, you know, sacrificing and, and, um, but, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's not, it's not horrible as I'm probably making it sound. It, it was actually a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to really learn. It was almost like, um, like a boot camp. You know, it's almost like I put myself through my own sort of like entrepreneurial boot camp where it was like, okay, you got to, you got to crawl, th- crawl through the mud before you get to go sit um, at the beach and you got to crawl, th- crawl through as much mud as you need to crawl through before, um, before you get to the beach and no one knows how long it's going to be or how short that's going to be, but you just got to do it. Yeah. So I, I've listened to your story, man. And, um, I'm I'm not laughing at the story. I think the story is marvelous, but it's like you had to go through all this finding mince me by key load and tightening the belt and all this stuff. What was the Lord becoming an entrepreneur? If you had to go through this muck or mud, like you said, what's the Lord? Why become an entrepreneur? Am I supposed to go back working a day job, right? At least you get paid every I don't know how they do it in the UK, but at least in America you get paid every uh every two weeks or at least once a month or something like that. So what's the whole excitement about becoming an entrepreneur? Yes, that's the funny thing, you know, like I was doing all that and, you know, my life became, <laughs> my life for a year and a, and a half became, you know, how little could I spend? That, that, that's pretty much like what I woke up with. It was like, well, how, how little, little can you spend? I mean, like how little, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, it's like, how little can I spend? Uh, because, you know, every, every, everything counted towards buying myself more time so that I wouldn't have to go back to, um, you know, the job or whatever. And, um even though I was doing what I said, this is the crazy thing, right? This is, this is, this is when, you know, um, there's something, I don't want to say wrong, but there's something, you know, fundamentally different in my brain compared to where it was two years before that. So the craziest thing was that even though I was doing that, I was sleeping on couches, um, you know, sharing rooms with people and, and like selling stuff to pay for rent and, and you know buying the cheaper stuff as possible to eat and and not going out and just you know i i didn't have i didn't i didn't go out and have a drink at a a, a beer at a at a club for like a year because i couldn't afford it and um i even though i was doing all that i'd never felt more alive whoa like i'm thinking about a beer as say in america like three or four bucks right you can buy a cheap six pack of coors for maybe yeah. five dollars so being alive, but you can't buy a beer, man. What is it? What's up with that? Yeah, like it was. It was. I don't know. Like I, I met, like either I grew up really quickly, or <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I really don't know. But like all of a sudden, everything would just just got really. I had a different perspective, and the perspective was that, you know, I would, you know, I would rather like starve to death than go back than and work for someone else. Whoa. Wow. That's, that's, that's a story. So, you know, I, I was just thinking of listening to your, um, your experiences that, you know, what you had to do within that year or year and a half, that, that type of experience, it, it is an experience that you, I know you will, you will never forget. None of us would when we experience such a thing, because a lot of the things, sometimes success, success doesn't hope, happen overnight. You know, you'd have to go through that ups and downs, and you don't know if you're going to survive or not. And it, those type of experience also is what pushes you to be, it, it gives you courage and it makes you stronger. What motivated you to keep going and to thrive? Um, you know, I, uh, how do I answer this question? You know, at the time, I and and I've never really, I, I understand why you're asking the question, um, but now and and if if I was talking to me, I probably want to, you know, ask the same question, but 
uh, sitting in this chair right now, and I've heard other people answer this question the same way I'm about to answer right now, is you don't even think about that. You know, you don't, you don't even think about stopping because you're just so, you, you're just so in your lane. You know, you're just so in your lane in terms of, um, you know, feeling alive, going for what you want as opposed to what you what you have chosen to, to tolerate. Um, you're just so in your lane of, um, like, just working stuff out and 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 having fun because you're working stuff out to build towards something that's important to you rather than working stuff out to build towards the bonus you know in the job that you don't want anyway you know what i, I that kind of resonated me on a higher level so uh, i mentioned before on some of my podcast so i had a full-time career and the company's now out of business now but i had a full-time career for like 14 years and you know, growing up, the premise was you, the first premise was you get a government job because you want job security. That was the baby boomer age for my dad. But obviously that philosophy is long gone. Most people don't even talk about that now. But anyways, so I had a 14 year career supply chain manager. Um, my main goal, my main job was to negotiate the, the, the cost of a product, sell to our stores. So I, I managed a certain category uh, monitors at uh, Fry's Electronics. And, you know, it, it was good the first couple of years. You learn, you're growing, and then you start realizing what's really happening. And what's really happening in that career that I had was it was a fear-based philosophy that as long as you didn't make any waves or stir the pot, you have a job forever. Those companies in business. The many make waves or try to do something against the tide of the owners or people that have uh, positions of power, then you're going to have difficulty because you see things need to be fixed, you know, but why not fix them? It's like having the trash needs to be taken out and it's getting full and it's getting full. You're not taking it out. You walk past every day, but it's not taken out. So before I quit my full-time career in 2017, I spent almost two years struggling and agonizing the fact that what was happening is I would work my nine to five, let's say Monday through Friday. And then before I would go to work, I would, I started a personal training business, training um, clients on the side, right? Not working for anybody, but being more of a contract worker, working out of a gym and just paying a fee, like you would at a hair, a hair salon or a nail salon. So I did that. Now I was going to work pretty much from six to, let's say, 8.30, I'm working with clients. I've had clients. Then from 8.30 onwards, because the gym was only about five minutes away from the um, my office, I would be, take a beeline from the gym right down to 9 o'clock. After 5, I'm ripping and running to, you know, after work to get to that client. That's at 5, 36 o'clock to get changed. Because I go from a, a shirt and tie and a suit to now gym clothes, which are, you know, shorts or pants and a shirt. And you're right. You know, when you're in that trench, you're in that, that mode, you're not thinking about what motivates. You're not thinking about, oh, well, I want to do this to get there. You just, I got to do something. And when I heard your story, it reminds me of when I saw, so what happens is my boss made a mistake of leaving out someone's contract for their salary on top of the desk. And this person had seven years less seniority, let's say in an equally same position. And they're making 14% more to me base salary, not including bonus. And that just tripped me up. So I said to myself, I can waste energy going to my boss and telling him and complaining, or I can leave. And in that moment, I said something to myself, I just had to get the hell out of here. And whatever it took, I got out of there. And, you know, I didn't think about what motivated me to wake up, how passionate I am about that. I had to get out of there. I didn't care about passion. I had to do whatever it takes to get out of there. And, I, when I heard you answer that question, it made me think about my my path. You know, my path isn't today isn't where it was four or five years ago, let alone six months ago. And but when you're in that, you know, now I can talk about passion, I can talk about motivation, I can talk about purpose because I can clearly understand it. And I'm doing something that clearly is in line with my passion and motivation. But when I had to quit that job, Maxwell, I'm telling you, it was you didn't care about the motivation. You wanted to get the hell out of there. Like you, you wanted to become a CEO, you didn't care about the motivation, you just want to do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's um I don't, I don't know, it's a bit like I think yeah, cuz I I want to find a better answer to that to that question, you know, it's like what motivates you and 
I think it's almost as if that, you know, when you are just so deep in your lane and so deep in your trenches, you almost don't need motivation. You know, it's like if like motivation is is like a um, a coping mechanism to do something that you don't want to do. But if you want to do something, then you don't need to be motivated. Mm. That's say say one more time. I'm gonna hear it one more time, please. Yeah. So what I've just you know a quote that I've just created in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Just so to say say it again. <laughs> you know, is that um, on this podcast is that um, you know motivation is like a coping mechanism uh, to go to, to push through something that you don't want to do, but you know, what's even better than being motivated to do something is um, is to find what you want to do. Yes. You don't need motivation. Mm-hmm. So motivation to the most stance is, is basically a Band-Aid on an open heart surgery. It's just coping, man. It's, it's trying to cope just to get by. Just like people always say, well, I'm going through something tragedy right now or circumstances are set back. I'm going to think positive. I'm just going to all magically this think it and it's going to equate to all these wonderful things and it doesn't work that way. So I, I love the way you said that. So, you know, you went through all this stuff, you know, that you've been through and now you finally found something you enjoy doing your CEO. You know, talk about your company and what you do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. So yeah, just, just the bottom line, the, the motivation thing, something that just came to me is that, um, you know, it's a bit like, it's a bit like when you wake up early in the morning you know, 6 a.m. your alarm goes off and you're like, you know, I've got my gym session, right? I've got my 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 Pilates or whatever session booked in at 6.30. I need to get there. And motivation is almost like the can of Red Bull that you drink just to see if you could give you enough juice to walk you through that door. But mm-hmm. you really want to do the Pilates and it was, you know, the Pilates was you being in your lane, you know, just straight deep in the trenches of, of what you actually wanted to do, then, you know, you don't need motivation. No, like once you're aligned with your, your passion, you don't need motivation anymore. It just comes, right? Not like hitting alarm clock at 6 a.m. Oh, man, I got to go apply this class. Oh, okay, I'll get up. Let me give, me give me that Red Bull or a cup of coffee and make it going. You wake up with determination to keep going. You don't you know, need like, caffeine or you don't need a Red Bull. You just wake up, yeah. you're ready to go, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. So what tell me about your company, what you do and and how do you help people? Yeah, thank you, mate. So I um, you know, really appreciate the opportunity. So um so our company is called High Performing Coach. And um our mission statement which we've just finalized in the last few weeks. So I'm really, really proud <laughs> to share it. I'm sharing it with new energy. Uh, Please. Is, is our mission is to serve the evolution of the human race by empowering coaches to transform the world. Oh. Wow, that sounds I very love that. powerful. <laughs> that's, your, that's your why story, it's your mission statement. That's yeah. amazing because once you find that mission statement, man, everything works for you marvelously. And so there's, do you know how many, how many, since you're only a coaching business and helping coaches, how many coaches are there around the world? Approximately, it doesn't be exact. You know what? I, I have no idea. <laughs> like, I, have, <laughs> I have no idea. I'm not, I'm not an analytical guy and I'm not, I'm not a guy that would go into like a job, a business market and then research it and see how statistically possible it is for me to succeed. I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a, you know what? Let's just take the boat out fishing and see see if there's any fish out there, type of guy. Oh, I like that. Okay, that, <laughs> that works for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. So forget the statistics. So how do you help coaches? Like, what's kind of a small process you do? Uh, let's say I'm newly, I'm a coach, and I want to, you know, I'm just like you, like you were starting your business. I'm starting as a coaching practice. I have no idea how to find clients. I have no idea to market myself. I don't have a LinkedIn. I don't have a website. How do you help these people? Because that's that's what the, the idea is, help people that are just getting started from ground zero. Yeah. So, you know, one of our, um, one of our like, I don't want to say tagline, but one of our like, um, you know, 
captions that we use to help articulate what we do is, you know, we help coaches build a high fee online coaching business uh, without websites or business cards. And the reason why we specifically choose that language without websites or business cards is because, um, you know, what we're about is showing coaches what it really takes to build a coaching business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we show coaches how to, how to let their coaching speak for themselves. So they're not out there like convincing or cajoling or like trying to, um, you know, trying to, to work out a equitable price per hour and, and trying to um, put out their, their accreditation, the certifications out there as, as badges of confidence as to why someone should work with them. Like we, we help coaches show up and deliver so much transformative value within their first session to the point where their potential clients are in tears. You know, they're in tears, moved, touched and inspired as to how they could get more of what that coach has just helped them to unlock. Awesome. So it's not like gimmicky sales kind of concept here, no business cards, no websites. It's more or less, is it in line with they're, what they're good at or in lining what their mission statement is? Or if you have no business cards, no websites, no gimmicks here, what really is the meat of this value here? Yeah, so it, it's, it's, it, there's two parts of it, right? So the, the first part of it is a really, really non sexy part <laughs> that, that we say to our clients right at the front of all of our messaging, marketing, communication. And that's, you know, if you want to be a coach that helps people improve their lives, you need you can only take your clients as um as as far and wide and and deep as you've been yourself so so we you know we we really hold our clients responsible for um you know if there's any limits that you're avoiding or anything that you're resisting in your life in your personal life then that's going to be a limit that you have on your clients because you know it's a bit like the um it's a bit like a personal trainer trying to help someone who to get to like 4% body fat and they've never been, they've, ne they've they themselves have never been below, you know, 14% body fat. Right. So they just don't have the access to really, really share authentically about what it really takes to, to, to break through that's um, that's barrier, whether it's physical or mental to get to that 4% body fat. So, so that's one part. So one part is we, we said our clients, you know, you've got to, you've got to be willing to do everything you're asking your clients to do. And then some, you know, so we say to our clients, if, if you're a coach who, who, who has a problem in their business or their life that they, that you aren't solving or you're stuck with, or you're tolerating that being stuck with that, you know, if you don't have the business that you want and you're tolerating being stuck with it, you are, and you're a coach that's asking people to not tolerate what they're stuck with so that they can work with you. You're a bit like the personal trainer that says, Hey, you know, you should take your health seriously. And the personal trainer is out of, out of shape. <laughs> I, I will laugh at the sense. personal trainer. I, I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of two things I learned after taking NLP. I don't know if you're familiar with NLP, but it stands for neuro linguistic programming. And a part of this outside what it, it is about, but they said two things are very important. The first thing is congruent. Just like give example, a personal trainer who's 20 pounds overweight and tries to tell someone else else to 20 pounds. He's incongruent with what are, which incongruent means harmony with what he's trying to say. So I'm trying to say lose 20 pounds, but you don't do it. How do you expect me to do it? You're not incongruent. No difference in a coach that doesn't have a coach or doesn't believe in their practice or doesn't constantly continue to keep learning. Then how you can tell your client to do all the work if you don't do some work too as well, right? Not congruent. But there's a thing that taking taking this this course that I, that I will never forget is called Can I? And it's spelled like this: C A N E I. Steve, Steve sorry, C not Steve. C stands for constant. A says for and and N stands for never ending and E I stands for improvement. So constant and never ending improvement. So it kind of made sense with you about your business. If you're going to have a coach who never doesn't have a coach, never pay for a coach, how much value reliability can he give to a client when he hasn't done the work or she hasn't done the work? 
Yeah, exactly. And and um, it's not just, you know, doing the work. It's also just being that constant walking demonstration, right? Because it's a bit like if, um, like sometimes we, you know, we speak to the coaches and clients and things that, that, are, that are scared to invest, you know, that mm-hmm. they're scared to invest because what if it doesn't work, right? And, and it's a bit like, okay, well, if you're scared to invest, what do you think your potential client on the other end, end of the the um, the phone line or the Zoom line is going to pick up when they speak to you? Because um, you know it's it's you, you know you are the like as every coach you know you're the limit of your clients, right? They 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 come into you because they you're the ceiling on them, you know, and and if you hold that ceiling down because of of what you're you're not willing to push through or what you're not willing to break through, then um, then you're not just not serving yourself, but you're also not serving your clients. Right. And, and the whole thing about like, for example, being scared to invest or scared to, to, um, to, to go again, it's, it's, you know, that that's exactly what you're asking your clients to do. You're asking your clients to face their fears. You're asking your clients to break through everything that you are choosing to stay stuck with. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny when we talk about that, what came to mind was um, a lot of times if you have that client that's doing a Zoom call or getting ready, sorry, have a coach getting ready to talk to that client on a Zoom call or talk to them on the phone, whatever they do or in person, it's it's about what they project in their head. So if the client, the coach is afraid to invest in themselves, right, for training or whatever, they then project on their client. So the client now may feel I should invest, even though it wasn't said, it's about the internal representation of the energy and projection. So if you project yourself, I can't afford this or she, or he can't afford my services. You inherently how you start projecting it on that client and they, they don't sign up. That's, that's, that's amazing. I'm glad to hear someone that owns coaching practice talk about that because it's rarely, it does exist. I mean, you know, I, I hear a lot of these, and I'm a coach and I, I get a lot of these things on, um, online and says, scale your business, you know, six figures in one year. Right. And what they really emphasize on is a numbers game. The more people talk to, the more people sign up. So I talk to a hundred clients in one month, I make it 10%, 10% equals this, what do you charge? Right. But you're actually going the route, which is more positive and in harmony with actually happens out there. And that's amazing. So with that, uh, Maxwell, how do people, if people are listening to this podcast right now and they're around the world somewhere, where can people find um, you or your services or your company? Yeah, thank you, Ron. I, I, you know, I really appreciate this opportunity to share um, how to get in contact. So there's, there's two places where we show up the most. Um, the first place is on LinkedIn. So if you search my name, I'm the only Maxwell Nee, which is N for November, E for Echo, E for Echo. The only Maxwell Nee uh, on LinkedIn, as far as I can see. <laughs> and <laughs> Um, our, our website, if you go to our website, highperforming.coach, so it's not .com, it's .coach, um, we do weekly uh, free workshops that's usually led from, uh, usually led by me. And um, in those free workshops, we basically give away as much value as we possibly can within uh, two hours and just trust that uh, the coaches who are uh, ready and drawn to, to, to taking action to build their coaching business will um, will want to work with us. So that's what we do. And we do that um, for right now. We ba- we do that every single week. That's awesome. So people can find you on LinkedIn and find you on the website and connect with you. And what I like to do with mo- all my guests that show up here is there has to be a takeaway. Um, it could be the person listening to podcast, or it could be Gloria and I or yourself. What is one thing asking your unconscious mind, not conscious mind, two sentences that you would say, which is very important for someone listening to this podcast? Yeah, I, I um, there's something I've just sort of recently dropped into a lot uh, lately with our clients, and it's that um, a commitment, you know, any type of commitment whether it's financial, whether it's um, spiritual, or, um, you know, just commitment to yourself, commitment to um, your partner or commitment to your business, or your clients or whatever, 
any commitment is not there to scare you, which a lot of people get can can get um, mixed up with, but a commitment that's there towards something that you want is there to empower you. Mm. Making commitment is there to support you, not hurt you, to empower you. Yeah, commitment's not there to put pressure on you. A commitment is there to pull you up and higher into a a a more powerful version of yourself that's that's going to make that you know make everything that you want a reality oh man that's amazing now i i I didn't ask this question earlier but are are you currently working with a coach or have you worked with coaches in the past yeah you know i i I love coaching i i almost always have at least two coaches so i've got two right now and i'm speaking to a third um and um yeah i i I always have at least two awesome you know what because you said something that i hired a new coach i always believe i have coaches so i'm always gonna have one or maybe two who knows but as i started getting more into the spiritual side of coaching and really um, metaphysics and manifesting what i want as i work with a current coach they talk she talks about because it's a female she talks about um how being in harmony with what you want manifesting what you want and what you just said right now is commitments are there to help you so everything around you is actually there to support you but at the same time what are you projecting outward and that's why i asked the question you must work for the coach because it sounds similar to what i've experienced so i i want to say uh maxwell it's been a pleasure hearing your journey here and uh watching you evolve um and um watching your your journey or at least visually i'm not watching but i'm hearing about it and it's so so empowering the fact that you're able to do it and anybody can do it it's just they have to have a, a confirm definite belief they can they have to see it in order to get there they can't sorry you have to believe it means you have to see it already in your mind before it actually happens in order to get there if you just expect it to show up without first believing it it will never show up so Again, Maxwell, it was my pleasure and glorious pleasure. She had to go offline. She had some, some mic issues, so I do say I apologize about that. Um, but it was my pleasure hearing your journey, your story, and I look forward to posting it and seeing more. I, I just sent you a request on LinkedIn so we still can keep in contact. And obviously, once I post this podcast, I will let our audiences know um, by posting out there and let you know as well, too. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it and uh, speak soon.